Welcome to the Books and Travel podcast. I'm Jo Francis Penn, thriller and dark fantasy author, bringing you escape and inspiration about unusual and fascinating places, as well as the deeper side of books and travel. You can find the episode show notes at booksandtravel.page. And if you enjoy thrillers set in international locations, download one of my ebooks for free at jfpen.com forward slash free. Hello, travellers. I'm Joe Francis Penn. And in this episode, I talk to Emily Thomas about the meaning of travel. We discuss the importance of perspective and time in travel writing, how sublime moments of pleasurable terror make travel so interesting, how to overcome fears, both real and imaginary, as well as the ethics of doom tourism, and how VR, virtual reality, might change how we travel in future. I hope you enjoy the interview with Emily today. Dr. Emily Thomas is an Associate Professor in Philosophy at Durham University in England. She's also the author of several books, including The Meaning of Travel, Philosophers Abroad, which we're talking about today. So welcome, Emily. Hello, it's a pleasure to be here. Oh, no, I'm excited to talk about this topic. So first up, what drew you to write a book about travel and philosophy, since one seems quite internal and the other one quite external? (laughs) That's right. So I have been a professional philosopher um, for for more than 10 years, but far longer than that, I have been a backpacker. So I did buckets of traveling when I was younger. And at some point, when I was writing about philosophy, I began wondering, does philosophy have anything to say about travel? Is there some way that I can bring these two parts of my life together? And and I started doing some research. And to my delight, I found that philosophy has lots to say about travel. And that was how the book was born. And then I guess, so you said that you did a lot of backpacking. So what does travel mean to you then? For me, traveling is all about experiencing otherness. It's all about going to places that are new and unfamiliar and and trying to figure out how to make sense of them, how to map them onto the world that you do know. And and so my best travel experiences have actually been ones where I have gone to some place where I haven't understood anything around me, (laughs) not not the language, not what's going on on the street, not the social cues. And and I have very slowly, by reading and talking to people, come to put the pieces together and come to understand the place. Mm, That's so interesting. So you have the otherness and the new and the unfamiliar. Does that mean that for you traveling, say, within England is not doesn't count as travel? There are definitely places within England that I don't know at all that I think are going to give me that travel unfamiliarity experience. Um, But you're right. I think that to be really immersed in the unknown, for me, I'm going to have to go farther afield than that. Absolutely. So you have this chapter on sublime tourism, which is so often these special moments we remember rather than all the difficulties around it. So Mm. tell us a bit more about some of your own sublime moments in travel. So I should explain that I use the word sublime in a technical way to mean a very specific kind of feeling that was picked out by 18th century Irish philosopher Edmund Burke. And when you have a sublime feeling, it's a kind of pleasurable terror. So it's the kind of enjoyable fear that you get from standing close to a waterfall, but not too close. You can feel the spray on your face, but you're not actually afraid of falling over. And and I have definitely had a lot of those kinds of moments whilst traveling. And often, because I've done almost all my traveling by myself, just rocking up in a new place, I find really terrifying (laughs) on the one hand, and, and also really exciting on the other. I think the first time I really powerfully experienced that, I was 18 and I spent a couple of months wandering around China. 
And the very first time I'd arrived in a big new city and I stepped out of the hotel room and just not understanding anything that was going on around me. It was really scary, but also exhilarating. That's really interesting that you call it that pleasurable terror. And you also quote Camus, what gives the value to travel is fear. And it's interesting. So you talk there about terror, you're using the word fear in the book. And <laughs> I mean, <laughs> it, it, what are some of the fears that you've had to face and give us some examples? And when have they been real and when have they been imagined? Some of the fears, I think, are very reasonable to have and they are not pleasurable. So, for example, walking through a city by yourself where you're conscious that it's not very safe, that the crime rates are very high and you're afraid of being attacked or mugged. And it, like that's not fun. And they are not imagined fears either. <laughs> but I think there are other fears that are more exciting and in a pleasurable way and that is simply let's say I have a fear that if I walk into a city I don't know very well I'm going to get lost well actually really what's the worst that's going to happen you know I get lost and I end up asking for directions in a coffee shop or something but the the feeling of oh maybe I could be lost that's quite nice feeling wise to have I think and have I personally been in some scrapes I have. It, what especially springs to mind when people ask me that question, I was once in a taxi in Zimbabwe that caught fire and the driver refused to pull over. <laughs> it, was, it was just bizarre. There was smoke coming out of the dashboard. <laughs> like We could see flames on the bonnet. And he was like, no, no, it'll be fine. <laughs> I was like, it's not fine. <laughs> I have to stop the car. <laughs> Oh, well, that, okay. Yeah. So, I feel like when, so you've talked about solo travel and mm. certainly as a, a solo woman, I mean, that can happen if one is just in London late at night or Newcastle late at night or something. I mean, <laughs> that doesn't have to be a, a foreign fear, but it's in a foreign country. It feels like it will be, things will just be more difficult. Even like asking someone where the bathroom is. When I traveled in India, that, that can be a, a moment of fear. So how can we overcome these? I guess there are definitely rational fears, but how can we overcome fear in order to travel to new places? I've recently been reading about Stoicism, which is a particular kind of philosophy dating back to, to Roman times. And one of the suggestions they have is that when you're afraid of something, you should actually sit down in your mind and work through what could possibly happen. And like, what is the worst case scenario? And how would you deal with that if that comes up? And I personally get scared by the unknown. And so the idea of landing in a new place, I, I find quite scary. I find it scary because I have no idea what to expect when I'm there. But if I actually read a guidebook and start thinking, oh, OK, like this is where I want to go. And OK, and this is how taxis or tuk-tuks or whatever it might be work here. Um, the more knowledge that I have about the place, um, I find that the fear goes away. It, um, yeah, the, the, it's like horror movies, right? You know, the unseen monster or ghost is always much scarier than when you actually see the ridiculous special effects <laughs> that the producer has drummed up for your movie entertainment delight. <laughs> Which is why you don't often see the monster in yeah, these horror things. Yeah, that, yeah then, it, then the actual fear is like, oh, right, it's just another vampire. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> It's exactly right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's, it, that's really interesting that you say that in terms of a guidebook, for example. So let's put that under the category of research, which is <laughs> you can research a place. And for me, it's like I, I often I will have researched lots of places, but then I just concentrate on getting off the plane to the first night's accommodation. And even if mm. I'm doing more free range travel, I will have a first night's accommodation book. And I Same. also, if I'm like a solo woman, I will make sure the plane arrives at a time of day that is appropriate because I had a terrible experience mm. at like you know, arriving at 2 a.m. in Tel Aviv back in the early 90s and the, the war with Iraq was going on. And it was honestly one of the scariest times. Mm. I was like 2 a.m. in a new city. I don't know what the hell I'm doing before the internet, etc. So I want to ask you because you've just arrived in Malawi in Africa, uh, yeah. which I have talked about on the show because I went to school there. So tell us how has this process worked with Malawi and how is it different from your your research? One 
thing that makes this trip a bit different for me is that I'm actually living here for a few months. So rather than traveling around, moving on every night or two, I'm, I'm actually settling in. And what that meant was it quite quite similar in some ways. I had the first couple of nights accommodation booked, but then I had to go out and look at apartments, set myself up. And now it's a case of it really trying to understand how basic things work. So things I was not expecting include there are many power cuts every day. And so it is not a good idea, for example, if you are working as I am to let your laptop go very low on battery, because otherwise when the next power cut comes, you might run out of battery quite quickly. So, so really, um, it really basic things about how to live here is what I'm now trying to get to grips with. What about, I mean, I think money is something really interesting because before mm. before the pandemic, it, you know, what, one would turn up in various countries and you might have been able to get some local currency or you just take US dollars or another mm. currency that people accept. But what I've discovered is post pandemic, even really out of the way places take mobile payments or digital payments. And mm. of course, Africa has a lot of mobile payments. So how's the money working? I know it's a very practical <laughs> question, but it's like, <laughs> it's, yeah, it's a big deal, right? It, it is a really big deal. And you are absolutely right. I'm, I'm making it via mobile phone payments, which is not something I have ever done before in the UK. Um, so I've had to download the correct app for this, and figure out how it works. And part of the issue is that people want to avoid the government taking a slice out of certain payment apps. So they always want you to use their particular payment app where the government takes less money. Um, yeah, it has been a learning curve. And I, I definitely find post-COVID, people want to handle objects less, including notes and coins. And that is a big deal. And so electronic payments are, are hugely on the rise. Yeah, it's interesting. And um, another thing you say in the book, so um, philosophy, obviously, you're a professional philosopher, which I think <laughs> sounds just amazing. <laughs> but philosophy and truth, like truth with a little t, and then truth mm. with a capital T, I think are really important. Now, you say that in the book, that travel books often blur the line between fiction and nonfiction. So mm. what are your thoughts on the truth of travel books, guides, memoir, especially if we're using them? to research places before we go which we are doing all the time okay so what I mean by this it is so with non-fiction writing we tend to think of it as being very factual you know the, the temperature was 32 degrees today and this place lies at a certain longitude and latitude it, but travel books even though they are within the non-fiction genre it, actually they are using many many devices from fiction they are using for hyperbole and um, travel books often have a plot where they will start you off at one point in time and then the author backtracks a little bit to kind of give a bit more context and then we move forwards in time again and all these devices and um, borrowed from fiction it obviously served to make the travel book much more readable but they also begin blurring the line and, and I think one of the important consequences of that is that we get more and more of the author's own perspective as they are experiencing the place and writing the book so if we would have this list of facts temperature, longitude, there's very little of the author in that. But when we begin to have the author saying, oh, I, I saw a hippopotamus in person for the first time and its skin was like this and its teeth were like this, we're really starting to get the author's window onto the world. And then that becomes quite non-factual. And that's part of writing a good story, but it's also part of what makes travel writing a bit unusual as a non-fiction genre. And I wonder how much so often books can be written from a, a romantic point of view or a way to try and perhaps make the author seem in a certain way. And of course, you, I mean, we understand that writing is also editing. So you you don't put in a lot of the stuff that happened mm. because it doesn't fit whatever overarching narrative. I have a particular place in mind, which is Venice. And I've I've been to Venice three times and the third time was by far the best. But I, when I went the first time, I feel like all the writing I'd ever read on Venice 
it, it and it was just completely wrong in my experience I got there it was flooding I'd never read a book about the flooding and how much it stank of the sewers and all of this <laughs> and how like, overcrowded <laughs> it was and those huge tourist ships and it really impacted it so it how should we approach reading travel fiction or just travel books in general? Do we just have to take them with a pinch of salt? <laughs> we Yes, we absolutely have to take them with a pinch of salt. I think travel books are always written with the author's particular vision in mind. And when you arrive, you may well have a very different outlook on that. And you're certainly right, Venice is one of those places that has been so heavily romanticised that in a way it's difficult to see how the reality can, can live up to those romantic images of it. And I mean, it, historically, if we go back before the 17th century into medieval travel writing, it, travel writing was absolutely chock full of lies. You know, people in, describe going to the Middle East and encountering dragons there and, or great whales that come off out of the sea and, and they're sort of wandering around on the local coasts. And Mandeville's travels describes meeting people with the heads of dogs. Um, <laughs> and, and, and a lot of this is coming from the idea that whatever is unknown, we can somehow fill in the gaps. And, and there's less of that today, partly because the world is is more known, but it's not entirely gone. It, our brains are still filling in gaps. Yeah, absolutely. And I wonder, I mean, obviously, again, Malawi, if people don't know, is in the sort of southeast Africa, but landlocked. And I, Africa is one of these continents that I feel travel writing has impacted, I would say, negatively, because mm. so many books are old. <laughs> so yes, many of the popular true. travel books are old. And they see Africa, which, of course, is not monolithic anyway, it's very diverse, mm. but it sees Africa in a way that perhaps it was 40 years ago so much has changed in in the last decade for example in terms of what what's happening mm. in Africa so how can we almost responsibly many people listening are writers as well or responsibly write about places to change stereotypes or or when we read question stereotypes that's a really great question I would start by saying travel books are about places, but they are also always about time. It, so it is always about the author's experience of traveling to Malawi in 1970 or 2020 or wh wherever it might be. Yeah, so I think when you are reading it, travel books, it, when we are all reading travel books, we must bear in mind the date that they were mm. published. It, and that's going to have a big impact on how we approach them. Of course, I'm a historian of philosophy, so I'm going to stress the importance of dates. And with regards to it changing stereotypes or, or leading us to question them, I think that good writers should be conscious of stereotypes as they are writing and, and flag them up. It, that seems like something that the best travel writers do, actually, that, um, that they approach people as individuals. That, and if there are stereotypes, it, they are mentioning them in order to deconstruct them. Well, then I, I have another challenge for you. because You talked <laughs> at the beginning about otherness and that travel is about otherness. And when we are other, I feel mm. like we have a view. We almost see things that people who live in a country don't see. Like when I go to America and I walk into, even just I walk into a grocery store, it always, I'm just, how are there 10 fridges full of different <laughs> sodas? <laughs> like it's a tiny thing, but I noticed that and an American would not notice that. Mm. And so when we're in other commenting on other places we travel, that gives us one view. But I also worry in this time when we need more diverse voices, can you and I as white English women write about Malawi? And how does that compare to a Malawian author writing about Malawi? If I were to read two books, one written by a white English woman and one written by an a Malawi author, that I would 100% be looking to the Malawi author as the authoritative tome. But I don't think that means that we shouldn't do it because you can only ever write from a perspective. All writing is written from a perspective. And that's the same whether it's me writing about Malawi or someone from Blantyre going to the UK and writing about England. And um, there is no view from nowhere. And um, the trick is to write from your perspective 
being conscious that you are writing from a perspective. So if I were to go to the US and write about how staggered I am by the sheer number of soda fridges, that I should be overt about that. And of course, be honest about the fact, well, I find this astonishing because I'm from the UK. If I was from somewhere else, maybe I wouldn't. Yeah, it's funny, isn't it? And I mean, I feel the same way. I think we have to write from whatever perspective. So let's talk about maps, because I love that you actually start with chapters on maps. I love maps. I've got a map of the world here in front of me on my wall. (laughs) Wonderful. Yeah, it is something that I find really important. And I've I've written a fantasy series about walking through maps. So I'm really into maps. So you say in the book, are maps things or processes? So what do you mean by that? In philosophy, we draw a distinction between things that are static, so chairs, teacups, trees, versus things that are dynamic and continually changing processes, like thunderstorms or running rivers. And and what I find fascinating about maps, or one of the many things I find fascinating about them, is that I always assumed that a map was a static thing. You know, it's something that you hold in your hand and you look at it much like a teapot and that's the end of it. But there are some philosophers who've argued that actually maps are much closer to processes. And in defense of this view, they ask us to consider things like Google Maps. So Google Maps are being continually updated, as are all these online mapping softwares. And then the question is, does that mean that there's a new map that's coming into existence like once every second or so? Or is it rather it's the same map that's continually changing? And when you begin to think of maps like that, I can then begin to think of other maps, perhaps written on paper, that are also continually being updated. So famously, during the Second World War in London, there are some maps in the British Museum that were updated as buildings were bombed. So as buildings were removed, people would change the map to reflect the new reality. And I... I find maps such curious objects. It, this idea that, that that in another way they are not what they seem, it, I just find fascinating. Yeah, I mean, almost as soon as they're fixed. I mean, even I was just looking at the one on my wall. It's an older projection, a Makita projection, and mm. uh, Malawi is still labelled as Nyasaland, oh, so that, yeah. which was its previous name. And of course, I mean, that's what's so weird, isn't it? You can look at a map, even like... Europe's changed a lot I mean Europe's changing Mm. right now we have a war on (laughs) who knows where that will end up but it's like these countries appear and disappear and it and borders move Mm. and yet in one way I've got this thing on my wall it looks static and yet borders move all the time and you say maps are objects of power so what do we need to keep in mind I guess in terms of who drew the map and in terms of power shifts over time so maps are always trying to tell us things and they can tell us things in quite subtle ways so for example whatever is placed at the center of a map it is given a feeling of geopolitical force so on historical maps it, perhaps that was jerusalem or athens that today if you look at world maps produced in europe europe is usually at the center of the map If you look at world maps produced by China or the US, those continents will be, those countries will be at the centre of the map. And that's telling you a lot about how the map maker sees the world and what maps do and don't represent. And it also tells you a lot about the social power that the map maker is outlining. So whether they are including castles or churches or huts belonging to peasants or not, that tells you about what they're trying to do. And there are some really striking examples of maps being used to persuade people in in, about where the lines of power lie in the world Uh, so uh, for example historically you can see lots of maps of the same place with borders drawn differently and and that's because the map maker is trying to convince you that here is where the border is my country is really at this size and even today depending on where you are in the world if you access Google Maps, the borders will shift um, depending on your local country's attitude towards disputed territories. 
which is just crazy. I don't think I knew that before I read that in your book. I was like, okay, that's weird. But I mean, why would it be any different? Because for example, I, we travel to New Zealand a lot because my husband's a New Zealander. So we have family there. Mm. And when we look at prices for flights in Mm. here in the UK, we get quoted completely differently than if we're in New Zealand, even if we're booking London to Auckland, Mm. for example. And we know now that prices of flights Mm. change depending on where you're looking at obviously I mean obviously the currency changes but loads of things actually change when your physical location is known to advertisers so yeah I mean it's kind of disturbing in a way isn't it and the way that the border shift I mean again the map I'm looking at there is absolutely no way that the size of the countries is right that the African continent has often been made much smaller Mm, hasn't it absolutely or, yeah yeah with, with, yeah which is this famous problem with the Mercator projection and that it makes it the southern countries smaller and the northern ones the ones closer to the center of the map and Europe is subtly pushed towards the center of the map it, it makes them bigger yeah, and, and there are various projections that seek to it, um it uh, address these concerns and when you see it, um, the size of Africa represented as it really is proportionate to Europe and North America it's quite a shock because it is in fact a gigantic continent and it's not this smaller this sort of squeezed thing that you get on the Mercator projection. Yeah, absolutely. So there's so many things I want to talk to you about, but I do want to come to doom tourism. You have a chapter on doom tourism, Mm -hmm. and which incorporates things like dark tourism to Auschwitz, for example, or but also places like the Maldives that might disappear or will disappear with climate change. So uh, tell us about doom tourism. Should should we travel at all, or should we all just stay home? In principle, I don't think there's anything wrong with doom tourism or dark tourism. So the idea of going to see a place before it's destroyed because it's doomed in some way, I I, I think, why not? (laughs) That sounds Mm. fine to me. You know, you can imagine there's a rainbow outside your door. Someone's calling to you. Come and look at it before it's gone. That just seems absolutely fine. And where it gets ethically tricky is when we are traveling to places and the very act of traveling is contributing to the doom of the place in question. So a really classic example is glaciers or underwater coral reefs. So when we visit a glacier, in addition to the CO2 that we may spend getting there, also trampling all over the glacier it can be harmful to it in various ways. If it's the ice is degrading anyway, then and people walking all over it can hasten that. Uh, the same with visiting coral reefs. Uh, you know, there are many articles on the internet, 10 places you should visit before they die off due to climate change. And lots of coral reefs are on the list. But again, the very act of visiting the reefs can damage them. And then it starts to feel unethical to visit these doomed places. Yeah, and that's why the this idea of the virtual reality or, or augmented reality or virtual reality really for travel. So I have scuba dived on the Barrier Reef and Western Australia as well, Ningaloo Reef, and I learned later about how sun cream you know, on your skin can mm. can contribute to things, and yet. I remember those scuba diving in those places very vividly and they are highlights in my memory. But Mm. I absolutely think that VR scuba diving is what I want to do. I haven't scuba dived for about a decade, like really not that interested anymore in all the gear and all Mm. the boat sickness and all of that. So to me, a brilliant thing would be virtual reality scuba diving to go see the coral reefs. But taking that further, is that what do you think of the future of travel? in terms of virtual reality? I think there's going to be a lot more VR travel for exactly these kinds of reasons. Travel it can often be difficult and scary and really inconvenient. <laughs> As and expensive say. as well. And expensive, yeah, absolutely. And, and I think VR offers us a really safe, cheap alternative. I think lots and lots of people are going to turn to VR for travel. I, I really do. And I think as VR improves, the more that that will happen. And 
I find that quite exciting, in part because we could travel to real world places that have been reproduced in VR, but also because we can travel to imaginary worlds that these, you know, that are going to be sort of created for our enjoyment. Um, and I'm looking forward to that as well. Um, I think that will be, I think that will be great, honestly. That said, for me, Part of the value of travel lies in the difficulty and the fear and the inconvenience. And, and I don't see myself wanting to give that up. I think rather I want to do both. I agree with you. And, and I almost split it into two. For example, I, I went to the Egyptian pyramids back in the early 2000s. And mm. when I see pictures now, it seems a hell of a lot more touristy. And it, if you go and see the pyramids, it's a sound and light show. There's thousands of people in coaches and it's, it's not like the movies, you know, but mm. with a VR tour, I could see the pyramids up close. I could potentially go inside the pyramids, mm. which you cannot do in real life. And that to me is like a, a very touristy experience that would be better off in VR. But Walking around the souk in Cairo, for example, or Alexandria, that is something that is not the same. So mm -hmm. there's the experiential thing versus the famous monument thing, I guess. Oh, I like that. I think you're absolutely right. I think the two can complement each other in that way. And that, that would be great. <laughs> I also think there will be a lot of people who would opt for the VR Cairo souk in addition, it, partly because it, it's hot and it's expensive mm -hmm. and people are bumping into you. And I think COVID is going to have a big impact on how a lot of people continue to be travel with distaste moving forward, that it's all just going to feel safer. Um, yeah, I have also been to the pyramids a little bit later than you before the light show, but post the tourism era. And what I was astonished by was the way that if you stood in precisely the right spot, you could take a photograph just with the pyramids against the background of sand. But if you turned in any other direction, <laughs> it's the tourist carnival. <laughs> it really lights is. And shops and, yeah. It's a yeah. really strange experience. Yeah. And I mean, like Petra is another place or Anchor Wat, mm. or there are so many places where we want to see they're on lists of our and not because they're on lists, but because they really mm. are special places. And yet sometimes you get there and they're not special. I mean, Venice is another one. It, realistically, I think Venice, a lot of Venice would be better. <laughs> better in VR <laughs> which is terrible I mean if you're listening in, in Venice sorry about that but I mean I, I it's just so so full of tourists and but then we come back to truth again truth with a little mm. t as in if I make a VR experience of a of the Cairo souk for example mm. I could walk through and record it with a special camera and that is my experience. But again, we've just captured that at one moment in time or yeah. we could then edit it to make it seem more romantic or to fit some yeah. stereotype. So I almost wonder whether that that will VR will again create this incorrect version of reality. I don't know. It, or at the very least, it will be a version of reality told from someone else's perspective. Mm. I think that that's absolutely right because what, even if, as you say, it's based on real camera footage, what the camera person chooses to focus on, are they looking at the spices, are they looking at the vegetables or the jewellery, what they're panning over, are they focusing more on the older people or the younger people, all of this is going, going to be told from a person's perspective. And were you to visit yourself, you would absolutely have a different one. So, yeah, it will always be indirect in that sense. But there are some VR experiences you can have now where I understand you literally pay a guide to wear a VR helmet that transmits things back to you. And then by telephone, you kind of tell them, could you turn left here? I want to look more at this. And so that seems like more that you would have more control over what you're seeing, at least in that way. So many interesting things. It, it, <laughs> lots we could talk about, but we're almost out of time. So since this is the books and travel show, apart from <laughs> your book, what are a few that you recommend, either just travel books or philosophy or whatever you recommend? My favourite travel book is um, quite old now, but if you haven't read it, I highly recommend. It's Eric Newby's 1958, A Short Walk in the Hindu Kush. He's wandering around the mountains of Afghanistan, getting himself into various scrapes. It's really, really funny, and it's also very thoughtful. 
I think that's great. And from a philosophy and travel perspective, my book is in fact the only book on the philosophy of travel. <laughs> but if you want to take a, a related but different angle, Alain de Botton's 2002, The Art of Travel, he explores the way that various artists and novelists have thought about travel. And that's also a great read. Yeah, I've read that one, The Art of Travel. And you're right, actually, it does have some similarities uh I definitely liked yours better so <laughs> <laughs> thank you that's really kind I'm no really no glad. there you go <laughs> well I think <laughs> the themes I mean we've talked about the themes I guess uh mm. in that you bring out in the book and I do feel like there's so much to consider quest almost questioning and I'm definitely someone who is romantic about travel and clearly you are too in that mm. travel means a lot to us and so we naturally yeah. come at this with a positive and romantic view of everything but yeah it's funny I think I've also just come back from the walking the Camino de Santiago and oh, yeah yeah the Portuguese route and I feel like I've been reading Camino books for over two decades and I'm just <laughs> writing my own obviously but I feel this responsibility to say some things that I don't feel enough people say about how like busy the route is and all mm. of this kind of thing so I'm pretty obsessed with the truth of travel writing at the moment so I, I think like your, your book much. really helped. Oh, thank you I'm glad. Yeah. So brilliant where can people find you and your book online? Yeah, thank you so I am on Twitter at Emily T writes all lowercase all one word if you want to check out some of my other popular writings you can look at my website which is www.emilythomaswrites.co.uk. Fantastic well Thanks so much for your time, Emily. That was great. This has been brilliant. Thank you very much. Thanks for joining me today on the Books and Travel podcast. I hope you found a moment of escape. You can find the episode show notes at booksandtravel.page. And if you enjoy thrillers set in international locations, download one of my books for free at jfpen.com forward slash free. Happy travels until next time.